I'm excited that you're here. And if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, today's gonna be a, a Bible study that I'm thrilled to be a part of. And uh, I hope that you get something out of this. And it's gonna be a, a slow build into a, one idea and a pretty simple idea. But I think it's, it's something that maybe we need to be reminded of in, in this season as we continue to follow Christ, as we continue to navigate the world that we live in and the lives that we're living. Um, God, how can we do this well in a way that honors you and gets the most out of the life you died to give us, amen? And there are some iconic verses in scripture. Maybe you've uh, heard them preached or you've heard someone quote them. There's things that you could say off the, the cuff that is almost hardwired into your mind. But what I discover is a lot of people don't really know the context. They don't know the ramp. They don't know the leading, the conversation that leads into those things. And so today I kind of want to look at one idea uh, that Jesus at one point says to his disciples and then really help you understand what brought that into play. And if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 16, chapter, uh, verse 24, there is this verse where uh, Jesus says something that you've heard some pre preachers say. This is the stuff that you wanna preach. You know, right before he even says, hey, uh, you know, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Anyone heard those things preached? Anyone thankful that God is on the move and God is victorious and triumphant and even the gates of hell cannot stop him and his work in the world. That's, that's amazing. And following those statements, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about death and his resurrection. Verse 24, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever, someone say whoever, I love that. This is an invitation for every single one of us. Whoever, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've been through, your experiences in life, the tradition you were raised in, the family you were raised in, the school you went to, the decisions that you made. No, whoever wants to be my disciple. And I love that about Christ, that he was willing to do whatever, whenever, wherever, for whoever. It's a beautiful thing. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And this is, is a wonderful invitation, but it is also a daunting invitation. Jesus is not trying to get one by on us. He is being very honest that if you want to be my disciple, uh, you are going to take part in my mission in the world. You have to be someone who's willing to bear a burden and you have to be committed to following me in good seasons and in bad seasons. And this is where cultural Christianity gets exposed for being shallow because most people have not taken seriously the words of Christ when he says, no, if you want to be my disciple, uh, you have to take up your cross and you have to follow me. And disciple is a pretty simple term. It ultimately means a learner. That if you want to learn how to get the most out of this life, well, you have to pick up your cross and you have to follow me. And I love this invitation. I love that this is how our God works, that Christ works by invitation, not invasion. He doesn't show up in the middle of the night with a crowbar as a burglar who breaks his way into your life. Uh, no, this is something you have to welcome him in. And I love the verse in Revelation that says he stands at the door and he knocks. And a lot of artists have taken a stab at painting and capturing this moment. And the detail that I always look for when individuals paint this, photo, uh, this idea is the door. I think it's most accurately painted and portrayed when Jesus is standing at the door knocking and there's no doorknob. I think that's the right portrait because the door to your heart is a door that can only be opened from the inside. And it's an invitation, and every single week as we gather, we hope and our aim is to extend that invitation to anyone and everyone, whoever. And all you have to do is acknowledge Christ as the Savior of the world and acknowledge your sin and need for that Savior and to, to repent and to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And every single week this happens and individuals uh, text yes and begin their journey with Christ. And so if that's you, uh, you can text yes to 85379. Our goal here is not just to make decisions, to make you impulsively raise your hand and pray a prayer. Our goal is to make disciples. And so with you texting that will give you a link that then sends some resources and some videos to help you uh, get started in your journey with Christ because following Christ isn't easy, uh, but it is worth it. Can I get an amen? 
And Jesus says all these wonderful things. And the question is, is what brought this conversation about? Why does Jesus turn to his disciple and say, hey, whoever wants to be my disciples must pick up their cross and follow me? Why is Jesus making this statement? Why is this the period uh, to the end of a discussion? What was Jesus getting at? What was the primer or the ramp that landed this idea? In Matthew chapter 16, it is fascinating and it is kind of launching from this idea or topic, the backdrop is bread. Anyone love some bread? I know that's a weird shift. You're like, wait a second, we're talking about bread now. But that is the backdrop. If you're gonna understand, hey, we're we're talking about the cross, we're talking about being disciples, and the backdrop to this conversation is bread. And I love me some bread. I grew up in a home where on special occasions, our parents would take us to Olive Garden. And they were cheap, so we all had to get soup salad and breadsticks. And us kids would just get full on all the breadsticks. Can I get an amen? I think the two groups that have figured this out are the Italians and the Mexicans. I like a restaurant that when you walk in before you order, food just comes to the plate. I'm hangry, I didn't plan this out well, I'm just ready to eat now. If you've ever been to Olive Garden, just know if you do get the breadsticks, the only way to do it is to also order a tub of Alfredo sauce and dip the breadstick in the Alfredo sauce. Come on, wave at me if that's your jam. If you've never tried it, come on, I'm gonna introduce you to an experience of heaven, right? That's a taste of heaven. It's like chewing on a baby angel. And uh, (laughs) that is the, the backdrop of this conversation. Jesus in the gospel does some pretty remarkable miracles and two of his most famous miracles have to do with bread. And It's amazing because at one point, there's the feeding of the 5,000, and in chapter 15 of Matthew, there's the feeding of the 4,000. Now, what you will discover as you go to Scripture is that counts the men in the group. It does not account for the women and the children. Someone say rude. And the commentaries uh, will kind of give you a span as to what that number could look like. On the conservative side, they would say anywhere around 20 to 25,000 people uh, were fed through these miracles. On the very generous liberal side of things, uh, they would say anywhere from like 60 to 70,000 people were fed through these miracles. I I say even if you go on the very conservative side, this was remarkable and impressive. And it's interesting to me because there's a lot of details about these miracles. And two of the details are, in the feeding of the 5,000, it says Jesus went to a desolate place. In the feeding of the 4,000, it says Jesus went to a remote place. But what I love about both miracles, it says all were fed and satisfied. I mean, that's the the beauty of Christ. There's there's so much of Christ and there's more uh, in store and there's enough of Christ to go around for every single one of us that we can come and we can gather and we can open up the pages of scripture and every single one of us can leave satisfied. One of my favorite details about the stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 is these are Jesus's um, biggest audiences. You know, so Jesus is out there teaching, all these masses show up to hear him teach and he gets long-winded. Anyone appreciate a long-winded preacher? No, all right. And he realizes, hey, we skipped lunch. We need to feed these folks. And he, he does so, but what is interesting to me is we actually don't even know what Jesus preached. We don't know what he said. Here Jesus is teaching to some of the biggest audiences he ever taught to, and we don't know what he said. In fact, we don't know where they were, and we don't know who they were. That's amazing to me. Anyone thankful that God still does amazing things in unknown places for unknown people? It's a wonderful thing. And I love that, that God is active in uh, places uh, that you would not expect him to be, that he just doesn't show up in religious settings. He shows up on the side of the road in your life in desolate, remote places, and he does wonderful things. And we don't know what he said, but we do know what he did. And at some point, I want to Uh, write my own Bible, which I know sounds like heresy, Um, but there's a lot of what would be known as red letter Bibles. And what are the red letters? 
the words of Jesus. And I want to develop a blue letter Bible that doesn't highlight the words of Jesus, but highlights the works of Jesus. Oh my goodness, sometimes, yeah, pay attention to what he said, but do not miss what he did. Jesus uh, does some pretty profound things uh, in these moments. And what he does is by doing so, uh, this catches the region by storm. And Jesus uh, begins to take center stage. And he finds himself in the crosshairs of a lot of different groups and leaders who are now jealous and irritated uh, with this new leader who is gaining attention. And this is something that you're gonna see all throughout the pages of scriptures. You read the gospels, uh, the religious leaders were frustrated with Jesus and the government leaders were frustrated with Jesus. And why would the government leaders be frustrated with Jesus? You gotta understand, Jesus shows up in a time where the Romans had dominion over the Jewish people and the, the nation of Israel, and they were a dominant empire. And if you are a dominant empire trying to maintain your dominance over a group of people, well, practically speaking, in that time of history, how would you do so? And one of the most practical ways to do, uh, maintain your dominance, is to maintain the diet of those people and to make sure that they live on a ration of food because if they're well-fed, they'll be healthy. But if they're not well-fed, uh, they'll become weak and it's easier to control weak people. And so this was a, well, this was a, a shot to the heart for the Roman Empire. Wait a second, there's a guy out in the middle of nowhere and he is feeding thousands of people and he is miraculously providing bread. And the, the thoughts of the Romans are, if he keeps doing this, they're gonna get stronger and we're not gonna be able to control them. And this tendency or this dynamic can be seen all throughout human history that when people go to Christ, what you discover is uh, they do get stronger. God does edify and sustain our lives and the pressures of the world can't stop his work in our lives. Can I get an amen? It's an amazing thing. And bread is not just the, the idea or the, the tangible miracle at play. It actually becomes something that Jesus himself would identify with. He would begin to refer to himself as the bread of life. And, and what is he referring to when he calls himself the bread of life? Essentially what Jesus is saying is, I have the ability to provide sustenance to your life. I have the ability to sustain you despite whatever you're going through. And we're thankful for a Christ who can sustain you despite what you're going through. Life comes with trials, life comes with pain, life comes with confusion, uh, but Christ has the ability to see you through it. And it is this moment that sets the stage, it's this miracle, it is this momentous moment that creates the context from Matthew chapter 16. Now hear what happens in, in chapter one, uh, in chapter 16, verse one. It says on the you know, back end of this miracle, they, they feed the 5,000, they gather up all the leftovers and they're about to board the boat and here come the religious leaders who are now frustrated with Jesus. And, and why are they frustrated with him? Because these religious leaders have been the center of attention. Up until Jesus showing up, they've been the heroes. They've been the ones leading and in many ways conducting the work of God and the people of God. They've been the center of attention. You ever found that sometimes in religious spaces, leaders love to be the center of attention? Yeah, you should pray for me. Imperfect people on a platform tend to let it to go to their head, right? And what happens is, is the moment they're not in the center of attention, Jesus finds himself in the center of a tension. They're frustrated with Jesus. Wait a second, he is stealing our show. He's getting all the attention. And this is where John the Baptist got it right. He was like, yeah, that's how it should be. He must increase and I must decrease. And these religious leaders in chapter 16, verse one, it says, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, if I were to create my own audio Bible, every time the Pharisees and the Sadducees showed up, I would have like a soundtrack go dun, 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 right? 
Because every single time they show up, there's a tension. Every single time they show up, there's an agenda. They didn't like Jesus. And have you ever found that uh, common enemies make strange friends? The Pharisees and the Sadducees did not like each other, but they had an even greater hatred for Jesus, and so somehow they came together. The Pharisees were, uh, would be more on what would be called the, the conservative legalism side. Uh, they were individuals who believed in uh, demons and angels and the resurrection and the afterlife, and they were just devoted to maintaining God's word. And in many ways, uh, they were aiming to do right and to honor God, but they still got it wrong at times. And then the Sadducees, they were what would be viewed as on the, the liberal side. So there's legalism and then there's liberalism. And, and I know for some of you, that word is a trigger. You hear liberal and you think politics, um, which I, I do think as a church, maybe something we should establish as we kind of learn to lead through the seasons that we're in is there's a significant difference, folks, between a political worldview and a biblical worldview. And that'll get a lot of amens in theory, but practically speaking, a lot of people don't understand what that means. And simply put, a political worldview views your faith through the filter of your politics. A biblical worldview views your politics through the filter of your faith. And what is interesting is there are things in God's word uh, that have taken precedence for centuries on end, thousands of years that God spoke and articulated his truth. And we now live in times where politicians are treating truth uh, like real estate and getting grabby and claiming uh, things that God's always been speaking to. And before there was a precedent, there was a precedent, right? That God's truth was established. And I think it's, it's really challenging because no one wants to be a part of a church that gets overly political. Um, but it's really hard to be a church that stays biblical when they try to turn everything into a political conversation. And we as a community just need to figure out how do we humbly walk this road together so we can honor God and have an effective witness in the world. I don't think we need to be abrasive to be persuasive, uh, but I also don't think we should turn our back and put a muzzle on God's word. And what will be the temptation is to uh, muzzle God's word and only exploit it for the agendas that we prefer. And in the same way every person, folks, is a sinner, and every pastor is a sinner. Every president is a sinner. There's only one savior and his name is Jesus Christ and we don't muzzle him and we all look to him. And when we get to heaven, we're not worshiping a donkey and we're not worshiping an elephant. We're worshiping the lamb of God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, amen? So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came to Jesus and they tested him. Now that word tested is a negative word. It's different than some of the tests that you and I have taken. If you take your driver's test, the goal is to promote you to a driver. If you take your real estate test, the goal is to promote you to become a real estate agent, right? Well, this is a negative word that it wasn't meant for his success or promotion. It was meant for his failure. And have you ever discovered in your life that there will be people who want you to fail? There are gonna be people who want you to fail. And that is just the case. Uh, jealousy has a way of uh, causing us to be very destructive and take on very bizarre behaviors. And here these godly people swell up in jealousy, no longer the center of attention, and now they start to act in very hateful and cruel ways. You know, I was reading one commentary that said much of the moral indignation that you see in the gospels with the Pharisees is simply jealousy with a halo. It is jealousy being disguised as conviction so you can justify your cruelty. And that's what they're doing, they're justifying their cruelty. And they come to Jesus and they ask him for a sign. Hey, we need proof. Which you can't help but read it and think, he just fed thousands of people. What more proof do you need? And have you ever discovered that there are some people in your life and in our culture and our world uh, that no matter what proof is provided, it'll never be good enough? And sometimes you just have to move forward with a resolute commitment and faithfulness to God. Um, so some people, it's never gonna be good enough. 
And it goes on to say in verse two, he replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. Now watch this statement. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you, you cannot interpret the signs of the times. He's saying you people have the ability to forecast and anticipate so many things. You can listen to podcasts and radio and you can turn on the news and you can read a magazine and you can see people foretelling and predicting. Hey, these are gonna be the fashion trends of the summer. Hey, this is where our economy is gonna be in June. Hey, this is what you can expect in November. This is what the forecast is gonna be this week. He's saying you have the ability to interpret and anticipate uh, all these other things, yet somehow you overlook uh, the obvious and you are unable to interpret the times. And I find that this flies in the face of a lot of Christians who are caught flat-footed uh, with some of the things taking place in our world. And God's like, have you read the, my scripture? Have you read the word? Like there is so much in there that would help you interpret the times. And he's saying you're, you're missing what's in front of you. Now watch this, he says, you wicked and adulterous generation, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Except the sign of Jonah, and Jesus left them and went away. Now, this is frustrating as a preacher because I like to stay in one text because a few verses give us a lot to talk about. And here Jesus references Jonah. It's like, oh my goodness. Well, if you talk about Jonah, uh, we have to discuss Jonah. And who's Jonah? He's one of the great Old Testament prophets. He has one of the wildest stories in scripture. In fact, he has his own book in scripture and you have to figure out, okay, how do we bring Jonah into the conversation? Jonah, uh, what I love about Jonah is he was a reluctant prophet. And I don't love that he was reluctant. I, I just love that God still used him despite his reluctancy. And maybe you find yourself in hesitation with your faith, and I pray that you discover God's ability to still use you even when you hesitate and are reluctant. And God tells Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. These are wild and wicked people who need to repent for their evil. And Jonah decides to run in the opposite direction. Ever felt intimidated by God's call on your life, God's purpose, his plan for your life, and the, the temptation is to run in the other direction. And if you go to Jonah's story, it says he went down to a port because sin will always bring you down. He paid a fare, so sin will always bring you down and it'll always cost you something. And he boarded a ship headed for Tarshish, which if you go to your Bible, Max, in the back, uh, the back of your Bible, uh, you will find that it was in the opposite direction. And that's the case with sin. You just need to hear that, that it will take you further than you wanna go. It'll cost you more than you wanna pay and it'll keep you longer than you wanna stay. And Jonah gets on this boat and what is fascinating is we discover God's ability to control the weather. It's a gnarly feature that he has. And he begins to... Uh, develop a storm around Jonah in the sea. And Jonah's on this bo uh, boat with these men and they're all frantic. They all think they're gonna die. The storm is gonna overtake the boat. And Jonah's like, guys, it's because I'm in disobedience. You should throw me overboard, which is a sobering thing. I, I just wonder if there's anyone with us this weekend who um, the people in your life, the people on your boat are experiencing a storm because of your disobedience. And so Jonah says, hey, throw me overboard. Now, it doesn't get much worse than that, does it? You are thrown overboard in the middle of the storm, but it does get worse. In fact, it says that God provided a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So here comes Free Willy. Jonah's out there swimming, and Free Willy comes up and swallows him. And I know it's not a whale, but that's the biggest fish I've ever seen. And it's, you think to yourself, man, it, I didn't think it could get any worse, and then this happens. And what you find is, again, it's a tender mercy. Sometimes your greatest nightmare is a pretty significant blessing in disguise. And the Bible tells us that Jonah 
is in the belly of the fish for how long? Three days. It's a, it's a wonderful foreshadow. That's essentially what Jesus is getting at. The only sign you're gonna get is the sign of Jonah. He's talking about the resurrection. I too will be tucked away for three days, but I will rise again victorious over death, hell, and the grave, providing eternity uh, for all people. It's wonderful. And I know people will be like, wait a second, a fish swallowing a man. And I would just say, uh, you should do your own research. There are actual live accounts uh, recorded uh, throughout history where great fishes, whales have swallowed people and they survived. You don't take my word for it, do your own research. Uh, but what is comical to me is the fish then spits Jonah up onto the shores, vomits him out onto the shores. Where? Nineveh. <laughs> like, like God gets him an Uber in the ocean and is like, I'm going to take you to where I need you to be. And I love it because uh, no matter how hard this guy tries, he can't escape God's call on his life. It's a beautiful thing. No matter how hard you try, you cannot escape the hound of heaven and his desire and his plan and his call and his purpose for your life. And though you throw in the towel, he will never give up on you. Can we give an amen to our God? It's amazing. And they have this conversation and Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The, the disciples are standing there. They've got all these basketfuls of, of bread and they get on the boat to head over to the, side, uh, the other side. Now watch what it says in verse five. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take the bread. The disciples forgot to take the bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast, bread turn, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they discussed this uh, among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. And aware of their discussion, which God is aware of our discussions, he's aware of our conversations. And if it's in your words, it's in your heart because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? They're, they're thinking too shallow. They're just only thinking in the temporal and the physical. I'm hungry now, I need a sandwich. And he's like, no, I'm speaking spiritually uh, in this moment. And a lot of times we're not on the same channel uh, as Christ. And if you're not on the same channel or the right channel, what do you do? You have to adjust the frequency. And chances are, if you're not on the same channel as Christ, maybe you need to adjust the frequency. Maybe you need to adjust the frequency of your time in prayer and the frequency of your time in God's word and the frequency of the time in which you gather for corporate worship and engage in Christian mission. You need to adjust the frequency. He says, do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many basketfuls, say it with me, you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered. In other words, he's saying, you touched it. It was in your hands. You experienced it. You were there. He said, do you not remember? <clears throat> how is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees? Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's talking about false doctrine. He's talking about wonky teaching. And he's saying, yeah, that's like yeast. And a little bit of it makes its way through a whole batch of dough. And eventually, what does it cause the dough to do? To rise. And I look around and I see a lot of Christians rising up in wonky teaching and bad doctrine. And coming out of school, it was, it was so much easier 20 years ago to identify what kind of Christian a person was. Oh, what's your background? I grew up in the Baptist church. Oh, that's fantastic. Or I grew up Lutheran. Oh, that's fantastic, right? You could kind of understand a person's background. But now... Due to technology, we live in times of globalization. In other words, you have access to every leading thought around the world from every corner of the world. And so we have developed in our culture uh, a culture of pluralization, 
a smorgasbord of beliefs. And so we're now going through the buffet of life, just saying, I'll take a little bit of Hinduism and a little Buddhism, and I'll take some of this Islam principles, and I'll take some Christianity, and then I develop what I call my truth. And I would label it as I'm a Christian. And I will oftentimes be in conversations with people who will say they're a Christian, and I find myself thinking, but what kind of Christian are you? Like, first off, let's talk about God. Does your God, uh, is it one God in three persons? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Because without the Holy Trinity, Christianity unravels. Do we agree on that? Okay, Uh, what's your stance on God's word? What kind of Christian are you when it comes to God's word? Is God's word authoritative? Is it infallible? Is it inerrant? Is it inspired by God? Or do you just think it's another inspiring book with moral teachings? Do you think it's something that you can manipulate, twist, and edit to your pleasing? What kind of Christian are you? How do you engage in prayer? How do you engage in worship? What does Christian service even mean to you? Does that make sense? And what Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying, listen, you are going to be faced with all kinds of wild ideas and teachings, and you have to be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Otherwise, you'll find yourself rising up uh, in the wrong thing. And it's amazing to me because what does Jesus draw their attention to? The bread. The, The whole thing is centering again on bread. And he says, guys, you had the basketfuls in your hand. And what is happening in this moment is Jesus does this miracles. The disciples get to experience it. They have this you know, weird interaction with the Pharisees and the Sadducees who show up and they're cruel and they're hate-filled and they're trying to test Jesus and get them to fail. They get on the boat and now it comes time for lunch or dinner and they realize uh, we don't have the bread with us. And I say that because In this time, they lived nomadically. They didn't have the luxury that we have to just pull into a drive-through whenever we poorly planned a meal. Hey, I didn't put anything in the crock pot. We didn't go grocery shopping. We're pulling into the the drive-through. What they would have to do is plan accordingly. And here Christ plans accordingly. And he does so in our life as well. He has the ability to sustain and provide sustenance to our life. But you and I are responsible for stewarding his work in our life. And what is wild to me is these men, these disciples, these learners of Christ get to not only witness, not only hold, they got to taste a miracle. They got to experience God's work in their life. And then on the shores of criticism, on the shores of cruelty, they lay down God's work in their life and they forget it. It it, it kills me. And I think Christ is saying, hey, you can't be the type of person who gets bumped off in your faith and forfeits my work in your life every single time you bump into a distraction, every single time you bump into a trial, every single time you face inconvenience. And I just am grieved by the number of people who continue to forfeit God's work in their life on the shores of insecurity, on the shores of fear, on the shores of culture, on the shores of peer pressure, on the shores of hatred, right? And it's one of those things that as the people of God, we have to be more mindful and diligent in our ability and efforts in stewarding God's work in our life. Because what happens is if we don't, we get down the road and all the things that God did to sustain us in the next season gets forfeited and then we find ourselves uh, in in a bit of a dynamic or pickle. And that's something that every single one of us has probably been guilty of and every single one of us is going to face. What has God done in your life that you laid down and forfeited all because you bumped into some wonky criticism of your faith? And... Jesus says, no, I I can sustain your life. Life is hard. Life comes with pain. 
And you do not have to take on despair and live a miserable life. The goal isn't just to survive. No, you can actually thrive, but you have to steward my work in your life. And tragically, what happens is we develop uh, what I would call spiritual amnesia. And we're constantly laying down and forfeiting God's work in our life, forgetting all the wonderful things he's done in us and through us. You ever been amazed by all the things God's done in your life? Like this is a precious week for me. April 17th, my freshman year of college, I fully and completely surrendered my life to Christ. God, I'm all in. I'm a fractured sinner in need of your grace. Uh, Would you be my Lord and Savior? And you have to develop uh, rhythms of reflection where you turn around and you think, hey, What are all the things God's done in my life? Because if you develop spiritual amnesia, like the Israelites who walked out of Egypt, who experienced a ton of miracles, but then forget about it, and now they're afraid to step into the promised land, what do they start doing? They start discussing, hey, should we go back to Egypt? Because when you forget all that God has done in your life, you will start to resort to former bondage. And that never gets an amen, but it is something that every single one of us has to realize. Have I I been forfeiting? Have I been laying down? Have I been leaving God's work in my life on the shores of nonsense? And then finding myself in a situation where God was trying to prepare me, but I realized what he gave me, I let down. And I love word plays. I thought, how would I put this in a cute statement that's corny that people won't forget? And I would say, one, what they needed, K-N-E-A-D-E-D, robbed them of what they needed. Another way of saying it is if you lose your head, you will lose your bread. <laughs> because what comes into your life comes out, uh, into your mind comes out through your life. And Jesus is saying, I have the ability, and not just the ability, I have the desire to sustain your life, to walk with you through trials. Though floods come your way, you will not be overtaken. Though you walk through fire, you will not be burned. But it's going to be hard for me to continue sustaining you if you can't steward all that I'm doing in you. Do not leave God's work in your life on the shores of nonsense. And this is the backdrop. This is the context. Jesus on a boat talking to his disciples about, do you see what just happened? You experienced something amazing, yet you forfeited it in a matter of moments. And Jesus asked them a question on the other side. He says, hey, who do people say that I am? And they start to tell him all the rumors. There's all these rumors all throughout the gospels. You think, you know, some people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they actually started a rumor that Jesus was demon possessed, that he was Beelzebub and he was working for the devil, right? And the disciples were like, I don't know. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're this or whatever. And then Jesus asked a question. And it's a question every single one of us need to ask ourselves and answer truthfully. Verse 15, but what about you? Who do you? Say that I am. What kind of Christian? Who do you say that I am? Here's what's gonna happen in eternity. There's going to be theological unity and consensus for everybody. I don't care what walk of life you've come from. I don't care what religion you subscribe to. On the other side of eternity, this is not saying all roads lead to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there comes a point where we all step into eternity and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. He's God, and he's the only God. He's God, and he's the only God. And who is that day gonna be the saddest for? I think that day is gonna be sadder for people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees more than it is gonna be for the atheist or the Muslim or the Buddhist. I think the person who has to have the conversation with Christ, who says, "Um, you did things in my name, but depart from me, I never knew you. And Jesus is saying, yeah, 
If you want to get the most out of the life I died to give you, and you want to experience my ability to sustain you, you have to take up your cross. You have to follow me. Folks, the world needs faithful Christians. The world needs faithful followers of Christ who have Jesus in the crosshairs, who wake up every single day, I'm following Jesus, I'm following Jesus, I'm following Jesus. And we we get dissed in life and we, we go sideways. I grew up in the 90s. If anyone ever got the best of you in trash talk, you would say, oh, you got dissed. Remember that? And that's an interesting word. Uh, this is it's a mechanism in our language that denotes a reversal. So where there's agreement, you put this to it, it reverses it. And now there's no longer agreement. If you like someone, you admire them and you uh, have affection for them, you put this on it and you reverse it, right? And you obviously are then at odds with each other. Well, the same is true when it comes to distraction. These disciples get distracted. And I look around at the people, I I get the lead and I get the pastor. I'm like, oh, don't get distracted, please. Don't get distracted because here's what's gonna happen. There's gonna be a reversal in your life. And where God was getting traction, Satan aims to reverse that traction in your life. You have to steward God's work in your life. And I recently read this. Um, I love history books. And there was this really corrupt monarch that had a pretty gross way of torturing people. And I understand there's kids in the room, so uh, I won't take this too far. You'll get it. But they had this way of punishing people where they would take four horses and they would tie each horse to the limb of the person. One to the right arm, one to the left arm, one to the right leg, one to the left leg. And then at the same time, they would whip the horses, sending them running in different directions. And you can imagine, I don't have to paint the details for you, what would happen to the person. And here's the wild thing about me when I was reading this. Do you know what they called that torture tactic? Death by distraction. Death by distraction. This is what kills a person. Pull them in all kinds of different directions. And the same thing will kill your faith. I'm just telling you, the world needs Christians. Bible-believing, Christ-following, Holy Spirit-empowered Christians, faithful Christians, (laughs) grace-filled Christians. So who do you say this Jesus is? And if he's the king of kings, and if he's the Lord of lords, and if he paid your ransom and secured your eternity, you give your life to him. And you wake up every single day with him in the crosshairs. Amen?